This is an overview of how to calculate the electric field produced by a point charge. Also suitable, of course, for reviewing what we did in lecture. Our strategy is to do every problem the same way. So once we've interpreted that this is a point charge problem, we're going to follow this procedure. Drawing a diagram showing the charge and where we want to calculate the field. Draw the R vector that points from the source from that charge to where we want to calculate the field. Define that vector in terms of its components in meters, converting from centimeters to meters right away at this point in the problem. Then write Coulomb's equation for the electric field, and then use R vector to define the two things we need to know in that equation, the magnitude of R and its unit vector. We're going to then evaluate that expression in a way that eliminates any need to re-enter intermediate results. I should add that this is based on strategy 20.1 on page 334, which is a useful reference point if you want to see this all in print. The key element of this procedure is to use basic vector arithmetic. That makes the method general, one that can be applied in the same way to every problem, and I believe effective, reducing a number of common errors that students make. Combining it with my tactical approach to the calculation also, I believe, reduces other kinds of errors associated with computing. And it's much better than some of the ad hoc methods that use different approaches to different problems, use angles, and often do some guessing on what the direction of the vector is going to be. Save your guesses for the assessment step to confirm that you've done everything correctly. The differences from strategy 20.1 is first that their drawing campaigns two different cases. By combining those, it's sort of cluttered. I've cleared up the picture to, in order to show them separately. It's also for a force rather than the field. Since I believe it's essential to focus on the electric field, I am basically eliminating some charges from their diagram. So I'm calculating E from a single charge rather than a force between two charges. And finally, I use a computational tactic to minimize rounding and data entry errors by eliminating any need at all to introduce an intermediate result by typing in the numbers on your calculator. The equation is kq over r squared r hat, where r hat is, of course, the unit vector found by taking the vector r and dividing it by its magnitude. We're going to use the value of k of 8.9881010 to the ninth newton meter squared per coulomb squared, and I'll just remind you that the units on k tell you the formula for E, because if you're going to get a field in newtons per coulomb, you must enter R in meters, and you must have a charge Q in coulombs. Just as important, remember that R vector points from Q to where we want to know E. And then once we've got E, if we want the force, we can just calculate it by the scalar multiple of Q times E. We're going to use that original equation, kq over r squared r hat, whenever we've got the r vector parallel to an axis, because that we can just simply separate the magnitude and direction of that vector. When r vector is not parallel to an axis, we're going to substitute for r hat its definition r vector over r. When we collect terms, this gives us kq over r cubed r vector. First example, when the field is parallel to an axis with the charge at the origin, the place where we want to find E is on the x-axis. So when we draw the R vector, we see that it is parallel to an axis and has a simple expression in terms of a single unit vector. Note that I've converted 4 centimeters to 0 0.04 meters when doing this. So the drawing gives us the vector R. I've written it in sort of general terms in terms of a number x rather than carrying the numerical values along. And, of course, my r hat vector is plus i hat because the vector points to the right. We're going to use that standard form kq over r squared r hat because r is parallel to the axis. All we have to do to evaluate this answer is evaluate k times q divided by x squared. That will give us the numerical value that multiplies i hat. Any signs that we need should be already in the value of q and should also be in the value of r hat. It's the second thing that we've got to be careful of for this particular solution. The sign for Q should be clear from your setup and thus easy to enter correctly. You should have written it down with your knowns and unknowns for the problem. But the sign for R hat can be easy to overlook. Be sure you've written it clearly in your setup and include it in your final expression so that you can pull out any sign associated with that unit vector and combine it with the value for the field before writing down your final answer. 
and use your assessment to check this case anytime you do a problem this way. Second example is at an arbitrary point. Again, my charge Q is at the origin, but the place where we want the field is up somewhere between the axes, so that when I draw my unit, my vector R vector, it's not along a unit vector direction. Again, write down the components, reading them directly off the picture or calcul calculating them if necessary, converting 4 centimeters to 0.04 meters and 3 centimeters to 0.03 meters there, as you can see. So now we've got our vector where it's got x and y components. And again, I've written it in rather general terms. That means we want to write E equals kq over r squared r hat equals kq over r cubed r vector. Always do this step. That helps you avoid silly mistakes like using r squared with r vector uh, other, or using r hat with r cubed. If you are in the habit of always writing it down this way, you will avoid those kinds of mistakes. You can also use dimensional analysis because you must have meters over meters cubed in order to end up with an answer that's 1 over meters squared in order to cancel out the meters squared in the value for k. After you've written down the symbolic expression, write kq over r cubed with the components of r vector. Now when you do this, q would be a number, x would be a number, and y would be a number, but r is still going to be written as just r cubed. So to summarize, write out the standard form of the equation, that first half of the equation up there, rewrite it in terms of r vector to get kq over r cubed r vector, and then it, fill out the numerical values directly below that expression so you're careful to copy everything in the right place with the right powers. So once we've got it in this form, it's time to compute. We're going to first evaluate the magnitude of r from square root of x squared plus y squared. That number is going to be in your calculator, but I will also usually write it down so I can mentally assess whether it has the right value. Is it less than x plus y? Okay, it's got to be at least less than x plus y. And so since I know roughly how Pythagorean numbers work out in terms of where this value has to be relative to x and y, I can tell whether or not I made some kind of silly mistake on my calculator before I go any further. Now, Although I may have written down r, I'm not going to put it back into my calculator. I'm going to do k times q divided by answer cubed and then multiply that by x. When I've done that, you see I've got everything in the problem I need to get the i hat component, including its sign, because any sign for q and any sign for x is going to be in this calculation. Then, this is the real trick, take that answer, divide it by x, and multiply by y. Dividing by x strips you back to kq over r cubed, so then you just multiply by y, and then again, with all of the signs correct, the correct sign for x and the correct sign for y, you have the value for the j hat component. In this way, you never have to type in r, and you never have to type in any other, write down any other number along the way and type any of them into your calculator. It completely minimizes the number of values you have to enter and reduces a lot of errors. Third example, which I won't say too much about, involves a problem with two charges where we have to do superposition. The main thing to point out is that you also want to be careful to interpret this problem so that when you go to draw the R vectors, you can tell which cases you might have to use. In this case, the location where we want E is directly to the right of Q2, so that vector is going to be along an axis, whereas the vector from Q1 is going to be at some angle. So when I've drawn this, I've drawn actually with a different color, so that blue color represents the case where I'm parallel to an axis, whereas for Q1 I've got one that's at an angle. And when I'm looking at this, I should notice that there's two pieces that have an X in it and only one that has a Y. So only Q1 is going to contribute to the Y component of the field. So tactically, since I've got two contributions of the x component and only one for the y, I want to do the x component last. I want to do the simple one first for q1 and then go and do the rest. So I'm going to calculate the magnitude of r for q1 from x1 squared plus y1 squared square rooted. Then evaluate kq1 divided by answer cubed times y1 so that I've got the y component from q1. 
then divide that answer by y1 multiply by x1 that gives me the x component from q1 and then just carry on add k times q2 over x2 squared to include the x component from q2 which is the only contribution of q2 to the answer so once i've done that i'm done but always assess. Be sure your answer is in the right direction. If you find it's not, go back and find your mistake, which is probably in Q or your vector R. For a positive charge, the field should point away from the positive charge. If there's a negative charge, the field answer should be pointing towards that negative charge. Finally, just a few words about strategy 20.1. I think it's really important, very valuable, that that example is in our textbook on page 334 because it emphasizes the use of vector arithmetic. My only complaint is that calculating a force makes it really better for gravity than it is for electricity because we should be focusing on the field when we're doing electricity problems. And my other uh, uh, complaint is that it uses meters for the distance between the charges, which is quite unrealistic for electric forces, but more appropriate if we were doing gravity between two masses. It's therefore more useful in sections uh, that we're doing gravity in the first semester of the course than it is here. And the picture is kind of cluttered. Anyway, that's where I'll stop. Uh, as usual, the graphs shown here either came directly from the textbook or were modified by me from figures in the